Ms. Sairin Ng, Mr. Choi Shin Kwok, ESM Go, my cabinet and parliamentary colleagues, past and present, excellencies and distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy to join all of you this evening to launch the second volume of Irene's biography of S, Mr. S. Rajaratnam. Let me start by acknowledging the tremendous work that Irene has done in putting together the two volumes. Listening to her just now reminded me of a quote, I believe it's by Winston Churchill, about writing a book. He said, it is an adventure. It starts off like a toy, an amusement. It becomes later a mistress, a master, and then a tyrant. <laughs> Irene has done it not just once, but twice. Congratulations, Irene, on your achievements and putting these two volumes together. Mr. Rajaratnam was one of Singapore's founding fathers and truly a Singapore lion. He helped to create independent Singapore and to define who we are and what we stand for as a nation. He played vital roles at every stage of our nation building. From the 1950s as an anti-colonial activist, through the 1960s as a fierce warrior against the communist and communalist until the 1980s as an elder statesman. Throughout, he wielded a gifted pen, in his case, a typewriter, and was so effective in mobilizing the ground and shaping public opinion. He was Minister for Culture in the first PAP government, and importantly, he was also our first and longest serving foreign minister. He worked hard under very tough conditions to establish our foreign relations, practically from scratch. As Irene shared in her book, foreign diplomats who called on him in those early years were struck by his one-man operation. Indeed, Mr. Rajaratnam himself reflected that the foreign ministry then was just one table, one typewriter, one secretary, and himself. But through his efforts, Singapore established its standing and gained many friends abroad. Mr. Rajaratnam, or Raja as he was fondly called, passed away in 2006. At that time, I was working as a principal private secretary to then PM Lee. I was also involved behind the scenes with the arrangements for the state funeral. I recall at his death, many young Singaporeans expressed sadness that they did not know him better. In many ways, I shared the same sentiment. I didn't have to ch the chance to work with Raja or our founding leaders like Dr. Go Keng Sui, Dr. To Jin Chai, Mr. Lim Kim San and others. When I started in the civil service in 1997, they had already stepped down from office. I only knew them from their speeches and the policies that they had left behind. So after his passing, I started reading and learning more about Raja. Fortunately, Chan Heng Chi and Obed Ol Haq had earlier compiled a book of his speeches that was reprinted after Raja's passing in 2007. So that became my one-stop guide to all of his key speeches. And reading them, I was struck by his sharp insights, his wide-ranging views spanning economics, history, politics and philosophy, and his incredible talent for ideas and words. It's remarkable, as Irene said just now, that way back in 1972, coincidentally the year I was born, he had already envisioned Singapore as a global city. This was seven years after our independence and decades before globalization became a buzzword or the invention of the internet. But Raja was a true visionary. He said our hinterland was not just the peninsula as most earlier taught, but the world. And by linking up with other global cities, we could overcome our small domestic market and our lack of natural resources and become one of the most technologically advanced countries in the world. After I entered politics, I enjoyed quoting what he said about democracy and the role of the opposition. 
He once noted how easy it was to win public attention simply by disagreeing with the government. If the government says white and you write letters or articles in the newspapers advocating black, your column will be red. You will be hailed at the next cocktail reception as an original and bold thinker. He said this back in 1971, and I think in many ways it still rings true today. Instead of opposition for the sake of opposition, he called for a democracy of deeds, one made up of active citizens who would focus on solving problems and developing solutions for a better Singapore. And indeed, this philosophy has guided me throughout my time in government. In every role I've undertaken, I've made it a point to engage and listen and to create platforms for closer partnerships with stakeholders in both the private and people sectors so that they can be empowered to take actions and solve problems on the ground. In 2012, when we decided to bring together the community and sports portfolios in the then MCYS, with the arts portfolio in the then Mika, I was given the chance to lead this new ministry. One of my first tasks was to come up with the name for it, and inspired by Raja, I wanted culture to be resurrected in the ministry's name, to build on the rich legacy he had left behind. And that's how we eventually came up with the Ministry of Culture, Community and Youth, or MCCY. So Irene is spot on when she said that I'm a huge admirer of Raja. Each time I read and reread his speeches and writings, I always find something illuminating and inspiring. I enjoyed the first volume on Raja, which Irene wrote and published in 2010. And so when she invited me to speak at the launch of this second volume, I readily agreed. Irene has put in tremendous work researching and putting together these two books. They are not just a biography of Raja, but also a detailed account of Singapore's history. For those who experienced the events of that time and knew Raja well, I'm sure the biography will bring back memories of the past. For all of us who belong to the post-independence generation, the book will bring us closer to Raja the man and provide a vivid sense of what it was like in our early years of nation building. Irene has truly done Singapore a great service in bringing Raja to life for a new generation of Singaporeans. So once again, thank you, Irene, for your labour of love. Today, Singapore is in a new phase. It's not just a change of leadership, but a generational change. I am the first Prime Minister to be born after independence. All of Singapore's previous Prime Ministers have sung two, if not three, national anthems. God Save the King, Kimi Gayo, and Nagaraku. I've only sung one, Majula Singapura. And that's also the case for the rest of my 4G colleagues. We all share Raja's concerns about whether Singapore can endure, especially at a time of growing global fractiousness, big power contestation, and a weakening international order. So we are clear about our mission to build on the strong foundations we have inherited and to keep Singapore going and thriving. As we venture into uncharted waters internationally, we must rally together as one people. We must develop new ideas and try out new approaches to problems. But at the same time, we should remember the wisdom of our founding leaders and uphold key principles and insights that remain relevant to our success. So as I read Irene's books, as I reflect on Raja's work and legacy, let me share some of my thoughts on what these insights ought to be. Uh, first, the need to stay open and plugged into the world. When Raja articulated the vision of Singapore as a global city in 1972, he was well ahead of his time. 
But with the end of the Cold War 20 years later, globalization took off and brought about significant economic integration worldwide. And we reaped significant benefits from this shift. We became a major hub for finance, trade, logistics, and home to multinational enterprises. As Rajab predicted, plugging into global networks enabled us to overcome our small size and lack of hinterland, and it created growth and prosperity for all. Now the world has changed dramatically. Nativist and anti-immigration sentiments are rising across many countries. Protectionism is gaining ground. Countries are prioritizing their own security interests over international cooperation. A growing sentiment of economic nationalism is challenging the multilateral trading system and reshaping the global order. And we are not immune to these pressures in Singapore too. As more and more countries put up barriers to trade, investment and talent, ostensibly to protect their citizens, we too hear calls in Singapore for the government to do the same. Raja himself anticipated this in one of his interviews. He said that pressure will inevitably grow in Singapore amongst businessmen and professionals who resent foreigners being awarded contracts even if they are done on the basis of merit. Instead, there will be calls for projects to be awarded to locals even if the work is of inferior quality, a demand to protect the second or third best against the best. And he warned any government that takes that path just to win elections will lead Singapore towards, he quoted, irreversible disaster. So we do well to heed his warning. Staying open is not just essential, it is existential for us. Singapore cannot exist other than an island city-state connected to the world. We need the best ideas and the best teams to excel and hold our own against tough competition. At the same time, we know that this comes with its share of cost. The rapid pace of change that takes place in any vibrant economy means there will be some who are displaced from their jobs or who struggle to keep up. What then should the government do to provide a secure base for all so that we can compete effectively as a nation. One option is to turn inward and away from the world, but then we will surely stagnate and atrophy. As Raja had warned, everyone will be worse off. The right approach is not to impede progress by putting up more barriers, but to ensure fair competition and fair employment practices to help every worker reskill and upskill, and to support those who suffer setbacks and enable them to bounce back stronger. This is indeed what the government is doing. This is why we have expanded Skills Future to equip every worker and work with the community to strengthen safety nets and uplift disadvantaged families. We will soon be introducing new laws to uphold fair employment practices. All these initiatives are part of Forward Singapore, our effort to renew our social compact so that every Singaporean can share in the fruits of progress and no one will feel they have to deal with life's volatilities or uncertainties alone. And that brings me to my second point on solidarity. Raja used to ponder deeply about what enables some societies to thrive while others decline. He referred to the ideas of 14th century Islamic philosopher and historian Ibn Khaldun. Khaldun wrote about the concept of asabiya, which is an Arabic word that describes the bond that exists in a community. Nowadays, we just say social capital. In Raja's view, it is this sense of community and solidarity that explains the rise and fall of societies. When a community first forms, everyone is prepared for austerity, discipline, and self-sacrifice, and so society prospers. But over time, as life becomes more comfortable, the sense of solidarity is weakened, people lose their social anchors, and they seek to advance their own individual interests. And when that sense of community and common purpose is eroded, things start to fall apart. 
Indeed, there are powerful forces at play that will test our solidarity and pull us in different directions. For example, race and religion continue to be highly emotive issues. Raja was an idealist, but he was realistic about what he called the primitive emotions of race, which he once compared to a wild and hungry beast pacing impatiently behind the bars of a cage, and we must never let up our efforts to ensure that this wild beast remains locked in its place. Of course, there are other aspects of identity that people do care about and feel strongly about. And the internet has now made it easier for diverse groups to organize themselves. Naturally, every group will be motivated to push claims and narratives that will promote their own interests or paint their actions and goals in an attractive light. We hope for enlightenment to emerge from this marketplace of ideas, but in practice, we often end up with an amplification of more extreme voices and views, thereby pulling us apart. And you can already see this dynamic at work in so many countries around the world. Echo chambers form online, people gather around their own tribes, they self-select information to support and reinforce their own points of views. As a result, it becomes harder to find consensus on national issues. The center is hollowed out and extreme views gain ground. When one side pushes their demands, another side pushes back twice as hard. Eventually, societies become deeply divided and it is impossible to govern. This is why we take this so seriously and we work so hard to keep Singapore society together. Not by suppressing any particular racial, religious or linguistic identity, but by expanding the common spaces linking our multiplicities. This is why we confront any controversial issue, be it 377A or conflict in the Middle East. Whenever that happens, our instinct is not to accentuate our differences, but to seek a consensus that unites as many as possible. And this starts with making genuine efforts to engage and listen and to bridge the gap with those with different views from us. When issues arise, we accept them, we accept the differences, and we seek pragmatic compromises. And we do so always in an atmosphere of mutual trust and respect to build shared understanding and to use our diverse perspectives and ideas to build better outcomes for all. In the end, Singapore can endure only if we care enough for our fellow citizens and we put our hearts and souls into helping our fellow citizens and making this a better home for all. Raja understood this well. We all know he helped draft the pledge. We know the second part of our national pledge reads to build a democratic society based on justice and equality so as to achieve happiness, prosperity, and progress for our nation. The original version drafted by Raja was to build a democratic society where justice and equality will prevail and where we will seek happiness and progress by helping one another. Seeking happiness and progress by helping one another. I think that's a key insight that Raja had on how we can take Singapore forward. We want everyone in Singapore to work hard and strive for excellence and go as far as they can. But if all that striving is focused narrowly on promoting our own well-being, it will only lead to more self-centeredness in society. It will engender a me-first mindset. Then those who are less able will envy the success of the more able. After some time, envy will breed resentment. And that's how the fabric of society is destroyed. So instead, let us pursue happiness by helping one another, by giving back by contributing to the community and serving our nation. Because when we serve a purpose that's larger than ourselves, and when we do our part to uplift our fellow citizens, we start to build a culture of kinship and respect 
we learn to empathise with our fellow citizens. We bring out the best in each other and we succeed together as one people. And finally, of course, we have agency to determine our future. When Singapore was thrust into independence, our founding leaders did not just throw their hands up in despair. There were many then who predicted that Singapore would fail. A day after our independence on 10th August 1965, there was an article in the Sydney Morning Herald that said, quote, an independent Singapore was not regarded as viable three years ago, and nothing in the current situation suggests that it is more viable today. And the commentators had some basis for their predictions, because a small country with no natural resources, no hinterland, and no defence force, and in a difficult external environment, any country in such a precarious situation could not have lasted long. But we were fortunate that our founding leaders, supported by the pioneer generation of Singaporeans, did not give up and worked hard to succeed against the odds. The Singapore of 2024, of course, is different from the Singapore of 1965. We are in a much stronger position today, but we do face new and daunting challenges. Now, like then, there will be cynics and sceptics who say that we can't make it. But Raja reminds us, a nation creates its own future, every time and all the time. Nothing is predestined. Outsiders can say what they want about us, but ultimately, here in Singapore, we have agency to determine our own future. Raja once noted that historically, the tendency has been for successful societies to go into decline. But he was also quick to stress, trend is not destiny. And so, as he put it, in times of prosperity, there will be a proliferation of leaders who promise a better life for less or even no effort. Such bread and circus leadership have worn the hearts of people time and again, who discover too late that there is, in fact, no bread or circus, and that they are in an arena confronting hungry lions. To be clear, I offer no bread or circus, no quick or easy solutions, but I know that working together, we have the means to go against the trend and to keep Singapore exceptional. Importantly, we have the will to build on what we have today and to take Singapore onwards and upwards. In a few weeks' time, we will celebrate our National Day, so it's fitting that we are launching the book now because there is much for us to celebrate and rejoice and much we need to remember and uphold as we take the next step in our nation-building journey. I fully share Irene's sentiments about the importance of our national pledge. And there will be different views on how best we can enshrine it, and we can discuss that. But in the end, it's more than what we do in Parliament. Every day when students recite the pledge, and each time when we do so, we are imbibing Raja's hopes and dreams for Singapore. And to me, the best way for us to honour his legacy is for all of us to strive to be that democracy of deeds, to take action, to seek happiness and progress by helping one another. So I hope this book will spark further conversations among Singaporeans and on how we can do so and how we can all take practical steps to move ever more closely, day by day, towards that ideal of one united people, regardless of race, language or religion. Thank you very much.